want to get to Romans 13. Fortunately, it is a shorter chapter, okay? And um, so we're going to start reading in, in, in uh, Romans chapter 13. <clears throat> and we broke it down to a couple of places. The first part is talking about authority and submission to authority. And here it is, Romans 1. Let every, uh, Romans 13 verse 1, let every soul be subject to the governing authorities. <clears throat> For there is no authority except from God. <clears throat> and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers are not a terror <clears throat> to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same, for he is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid, for he does not bear the, soul in, uh, the sword in vain, for he is God's minister, an avenger, to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Therefore, you must be subject not only because of wrath, but also for conscience' sake. Let's break this down. Authority is the ability to tell somebody what they need to do. Okay, that's what it, the Greek word for this particular authority, okay, is not dunamis. It's exousius, where it's executive power. It's the ability to tell somebody what to do, and they have to do it or else there'd be consequences. It's interesting that Paul is saying this to the church at Rome. Why? It's because the Christians are being persecuted for serving another king, King Jesus. So the rumors were going around that they wouldn't subject themselves to the Roman law. So Paul had a twofold reason for being able to share this. He wanted to make sure that if anybody read his writings, that they were not against any of the laws of Rome or Caesar. And he's saying, be subject to them, the governing authorities. But if you look at the kingdom that God created, everything operates under authority and submission to authority. Everything. And there are no authorities given except by God. These authorities that God gives to end rulers can be misused. They can be uh, used for evil or good. But all authority is given by God. And therefore, he's saying, if you want peace, obey the law. I've talked to so many people that were, were thieves and individuals that had done so many unscrupulous dealings. They don't sleep well at night. I said, you know what? If you want to have a good conscience, obey the law. I remember back in the days in the army before I was a Christian and, uh, you know, it was a heavy drug time and, and I remember we pulling up to a 7-Eleven and uh, I had a van at that time and everybody was a hippie even if you're in the army with short hair. And I remember we had pot in the car and the cops pulled up and we all were paranoid as heck. So the cops pull up and we had a, I had an escape hatch drilled in the bottom of the van so we could dump the drugs if we ever had to. Yeah, Pastor Rob was not a nice guy before he was saved. <laughs> so anyhow, I panicked. I said, okay, escape hatch. So they took all this stuff and they, they dumped it out so that it would be outside uh, and under the van. And sure enough, we go into the 7-Eleven and the police officer was just nice. Hi, how you doing? And everything like that. We noticed you're probably in the service. You're not Fort Knox. You know, I said, yeah, yeah, we're in there. Meanwhile, I'm sweating and panicking and everything else like that. And we drive away, and I said, I don't believe it, man. We just got rid of all of that. We just fought that stuff. We were paranoid. Why? Because we were afraid of the authority. Now, when I pass police officers, I feel real comfortable and safe. Okay? How many people are kind of that? Unless you're speeding. Unless you're red, a red light. Okay? Or you didn't come to a full stop before you made the right on red. It's allowed. Come on. But that's what conscience is all about. You want to sleep well, submit to authority. But the opposite of submitting to authority is rebellion. And the Bible says that rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Why would it be that way? Because rebellion against authority is a spiritual concept that first started with the first rebellious individual, and that was Lucifer. He rebelled against the authority of God. And he said, I will ascend my throne up to the 
throne of the Most High. Who is he? At that time, nobody had ever seen God at any time. But they knew his power. But they didn't know how much power he had. He didn't know how much authority. So when Lucifer went ahead and rebelled, caused the first sin. By the way, the first sin is rebellion. So rebellion against authority always is going to violate conscience. It's going to rob you of peace and serenity. Okay? And if you're a child and not listen to your parents, it's going to rob you of your allowance money, or it's going to, you're going to have to take a time out and go to your room. Okay? But defiance to authority always brings about discomfort. It's the way it is. It's through the whole animal kingdom. Mice are doing a real good job, man, when they get a hold of a, you know, peanut butter and jelly sandwich or any kind of food. Okay, and they are just in heaven. Their taste buds are going, I'm in heaven. I'm in heaven. You know that song? You don't remember that song. Cheek to cheek. Okay, so anyhow, the mouse, he's got a problem. I'm just trying to wake you up. The, the, some of you look like you're a little sleepy. Okay, but the mouse has got a problem as soon as he sees a cat, and what happens? All of a sudden, his adrenaline starts going. He's in trouble, why? Because the cat has authority over the mouse. I mean, it's just the way it is, okay? Who's got authority over the cat? Okay, the dog thinks he does. Only if the cat is declawed, which I don't recommend. Okay, but cats are nasty to dogs. Okay? They're nasty. But my point is this, that in the animal kingdom, everything is in authority and under authority. Because the mouse is absolutely in control of all the bugs and stuff. It's bigger. Okay? It's the way it is. But if you want peace, you submit to authority. I've talked to people in council of individuals that... That, that have absolutely not paid taxes for 10 years, and they said, what do I do? And they, they're pretty wealthy, but at the same time, they have no peace, nothing. I said, you gotta get this straightened out. I said, every time the IRS or New York State grants an amnesty program, take it. And they usually do. They're so hard up for money that they will absolutely, they have these amnesty programs, take it. Okay, sometimes you can get out with 50 cents on a dollar, 25 cents on a dollar, you can pay it off over time. But rest assured, there is no, from what I understand, I know federally, I don't think there's any statute of limitations for uh, income tax evasion. That's how they got Al Capone. And they get anybody, they can get anybody on that. Okay, so I don't think they've changed that rule. Okay, but, um, but for you, if you submit to authority, okay, you got no problem. Even when authority is not really good, you're still going to have more peace than trying to go ahead against it. But you should pray that God would get you out of that particular situation, such as if you lived in a, a dictatorship country. Okay? I mean, what are you going to do? You can try to get out of it, but if you want peace, unless you're going to rebel and think you can overcome, you're going to have a problem. It's not that God honors evil authority, but it is down here on this earth, and we're living in an evil world right now because evil, Satan, as the Apostle John said, is the God of this world, small g. He's got the world. He's the, you might say, the God, of the, carnal, the God of the carnal nature. So if you submit to God and God's rules and laws, you will have peace with heaven. And there's no reason for the devil to be able to come to be able to snatch anything from you. Okay? So that's basically what it's saying here. And he's leading up to this next thing that all the Roman tax collectors were really probably said, okay, we know that Paul isn't what people were saying. Romans chapter 13, verses 6 and 7. For because of this, you will also pay taxes. Nobody even wants to mention it. <laughs> For they are God's ministers attending continually to do this very thing. You notice how he's wording this so that there's no Roman officials that are going to have a problem? with this letter because it was going to be passed to everyone around and sooner or later somebody was going to get a hold of it that wasn't a Christian and say aha we got evidence against Paul there was no evidence that he was ever against Caesar 
or against paying taxes to Rome. At this particular time, Rome was, was in trouble. They were into deficit spending, uh, big time, and uh, they had some serious problems. And they were raising taxes and raising taxes and raising taxes, kind of like the United States of America. Okay, the way we could do it though is we just fool everybody by printing money and flooding it. Therefore, you know, the $21 trillion of debt that we have right now, think of a trillion dollars. What is a trillion? How many times a million? Is it 10,000 times 10,000 is a trillion? Somebody can figure it out. Or is it 1,000 times 1,000 is, maybe it's 1,000 millions times 1,000 millions is a trillion. I don't know. Somebody get back to me on that before the end of service or some other, what is it? 1,000 times 1,000, 1,000 millions times 1,000 millions is a trillion. Okay, and we're 20, is that right? 10,000 billion? 1,000 billions times 1,000 billions, is it? No. Let's put it this way. It's more money than you'll ever see in your life, okay? This is the greatest debt that the world has ever seen in the history of mankind. And it cannot be paid back. So, you know, you talk about deficit spending, forget it. Um, so that, that's a real problem. So we pay taxes here, and the Roman Empire collapsed because they ran out of not only money, but the people just became so overburdened that they lost complete faith in the government to be able to get anything done because they could not print any more money. They just didn't have it. Back then they used gold and silver and things. There was no paper dollars, okay? Uh, and paper basically is just, it's not even worth the, the print ink on the paper. It's just a good faith of you trusting that the government is not gonna let this thing collapse. And we know that the government wouldn't do that, right? We know that the government is always for us and everything like that. The point is, we're supposed to obey the authorities and we pay taxes. You know, and uh, that's what we have to do. So, verse 7, render therefore to all due, taxes to whom taxes are due, customs to whom customs, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. So in essence, Paul is basically telling the church, listen, don't make waves with the Roman Empire, but also there's a, the principle is the authorities are given by God. If you want to have the peace, okay, look for authority and submit to it. Don't be a rebel. If somebody is over you on your job and authority, whether you like them or not, they're over you. Now, you can make it easy for yourself or harder for yourself by complaining all the time for two reasons. Number one, if you complain to, a, to somebody you work with and they're a co-equal, okay, how do you know that you can trust that this individual is not going to go to them? Even if they say, trust me, you can tell me what you think, okay? Because it isn't that way. Some people have found out you can't even trust your family members when you tell them things, let alone a coworker who might want your job or they're looking to get promoted, okay? And if you ever wanna know how business works, watch the, or get the book or watch the play, How to Succeed in Business Without Ever Really Trying, okay? That is a great, great analogy of what goes on in this king of the mountain thing called the business world. But don't trust your coworkers and complain to them. But if you want to really do good on your job, work as if you're working for Jesus and forget about your boss above you. Because that's what the Bible says we should do. Do all as if you were working for Jesus. And I learned that a long time ago. When you're working a job, nobody likes to clean the coffee pot. You clean the coffee pot. You know why? I tell you why. Uh, because most bosses are gonna look at the individual who goes the extra mile when they're not getting paid for it, when they're thinking about somebody, if you have the skills to be able to move up into a position. They're not gonna look for the person who's always trying to skate out of everything or is always gonna be late to somewhere. They're gonna look for the person who's um, very consistent. And I'll tell you right now, I hear it all the time from business employers, if you wanna really, really move up in job, be consistent. Because the biggest complaint I hear from young people today that they're hiring, they can't find good workers. They're late, they lie, they, they don't come to work on time. They, uh, if it's a sunny day, they already know, 
you know, a lot of people aren't going to show up in the fast food restaurants because, you know, it's a nice day. There's only a job that way. But if you're consistent doing it, when they're looking for somebody to be promoted, they're going to look for somebody who has a good track record. Nobody wants to hire somebody who's going to come when they feel like it or they're not going to want to do certain work. Okay? But be a good employee. Work for the Lord, and the Lord will make sure that if not that job, God will open up another door for you. But if you're working for Jesus, no matter what you do down here, then remember, promotion doesn't come. What does the Bible say? From the east to the west, where does it come from? The Lord. The Lord, who is the source of all authority, and he can open up doors that no man can shut. That's just some word of advice. Romans 13, verses 8 to 10, we shift gears, and he says, Oh, no one anything except to love one another. For he who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, that means don't lie, you know, about somebody. You shall not covet, you know, greedily want something somebody else has. And if there's any other commandment, all are summed up in this saying, you, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. It's a hold on from the Old Testament, but Jesus said, the whole law and the prophets can be summed up into these two laws. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your mind, all of your strength. And the second is like the first. It's connected. Love your neighbor as yourself. I like to say this. If you don't love God with all of your heart, which is really hard to do, but we're trying, and all your strength, you'll never be able to love your neighbor as you do yourself. And move on to the next thing where Jesus said, love your enemies. We're having trouble loving our neighbors. I mean, some of us have trouble loving our own family members, okay? Let alone try to love the neighbor and then love your enemies. Do good to those who despitefully use you. I have a real problem with that. I'm getting better as I'm getting older because I just don't want to fight with carnal nature anymore. I just don't want to. I'm just going to love anyhow. You know, just say, you know what? My favorite thing is, you know, the whole world's gone nuts. Okay, they're all out of their mind. Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. They're all insane. And I just let it go because I don't want my peace taken. I'm tired of fighting with people. I'm tired of arguing with people. So I'm just going to go ahead and uh, we have a rule in our household. There's no yelling and screaming. That's it. I mean, just there is none. It's just a, it's a no-no. Okay? You can get upset. Okay? But then you got to time out. Get out of here. Don't, don't rob the peace in the house. We don't hear it. When you want to talk about it, we can talk about it. But there is no argument. We really don't have any arguing in our household, thank God. And I'm just happy about that. You know? But I know that there's a lot of this that can go on in the household. But what somebody's got to stand up and be the thermostat and say, listen, oh, come on, we got to live together, we're family, you know, and that's it. we got to work these things out, not with anger and screaming and yelling. But usually it has a lot to do with the idea that somebody's not submitting to the authority of the one who can tell what to do. Parents have authority over the children. Husbands are the head of the wife, but they co-lead the children, and they have the right to ask the children to do things, and they don't have to explain the reasons to the children. Why do I have to do that? Because I am your father, that's why. Father means that you are the child. I have authority over you given me by God. I don't have to give you a reason. You just have to do and obey. You have it very easy, okay? All you have to do is listen to me and do what I ask you to do. Me. I gotta go to work, I gotta pay the bills, I gotta deal with the boss, and what do you do? You sit home, play with your cell phone, you look at your, your computer, you go to school, you play with your friends, and you drink Starbucks coffee, and stuff like this. You got nothing. Just listen to me. That's all I ask you to do. And if you do that, it will go well with you. If you don't, I don't bear this sword in vain. That doesn't mean it's a metaphor, okay? In other words, I have the authority over your life. And I'm not going to change. You have to change. I'm not molding to your attitude. You have to mold to what I ask you to do. And you will have peace. There's always peace when you just give in. In fact, for us adults, there's a ministry in the Bible called the Why Not Rather Be Wrong Ministry. Did you ever hear that? Ah, it's a ministry I found. The Apostle Paul said, brother and brother, brother goes to court with brother. And, you know, you're not getting along a metaphor. You know, I'm just paraphrasing it. He says, why not rather be wrong for the sake of peace? That's a clue with some people who you just can't get. In other words, I'm not talking about children. I'm talking about co-equals. 
you know, like to adults. Why not rather be wrong for the sake of it? You mean I can actually give in even though I'm not right? Yeah, you can do that for the sake of peace. A lot of women have to do that with overbearing husbands. Okay? Not that they're not strong, but the husbands don't play fair. So what are they going to do? For the sake of the peace in the house and for the kids, they give in. So why not rather be wrong for the sake of peace ministry? Who do you think is going to be blessed by God? The person who says, you know what? Fine. I don't agree with you, but for the sake of peace and for the sake of the family and the house, I'm going to give in. Guess who's going to get the blessing? You. Why? Because anxiety is not going to build up you anymore. The other individual who is not being fair is going to have anxiety within them. It's going to affect the neurological system. It's going to affect the brain chemicals floating in their brain. I can guarantee you that the source of most anger in the world today is because you have not Okay, because you ask not, and when you ask, you ask for this, so you can spend it on your own pleasures, and you do not get what you want, so you commit murder. It's all. Murders are always happening, not by accident. That's an accidental, you know, somebody, oh, I'm sorry, you know? I'm sorry, I ran you over, I didn't mean to, I didn't see you. Well, that's a lot different than, I want to kill you, and then they kill the person. It's usually because you didn't get in your way. I know this is so simplistic, but in reality, this is what makes the world go round. You want to have peace? Give in. I don't want to fight no more. How many people are with me? Not going to fight. But I'm also not giving in to rebellious people that if you're in the wrong. But I'll do it with a smile on my face in the scriptures. And I'll keep trying to get you this reason. Okay, come, let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be what? White as snow. All right, let's finish this up. Romans 13, verses 11 to 14. And do this. Knowing the time that now is the high time to wake out of sleep, for now our salvation is nearer than we first believed. It's been said that when Paul wrote this, all of the disciples in the church of Jesus Christ believed that the Lord was coming back in their lifetime. That's why Paul wrote this. Now, of course, almost 2,000 years have passed. But the apostle Paul wrote, our salvation is nearer than we believed because they were really believing that Christ was going to return. He didn't return in their lifetime and they went to be with the Lord. Verse 12, the night is far spent, the day is at hand, therefore let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. That's a metaphor for the idea is, you know, don't embrace the darkness of the world and the sins of the world. It doesn't matter if it's popular. It doesn't mean it's right. In Germany, when they were killing Jews, it was popular. It didn't mean it was right. The killing of unborn children, it might be popular today, but it doesn't mean it's right. Slavery back in the early 1800s, okay, if you lived in the South, it was right, okay, because black people were not human beings. So therefore, they were just property, and they could be bought and sold just like cows and everything else like that. You see how easy the human mind can go ahead and deceive other human minds? And we think we're so smart. But if the Lord had tarried 100 years from now, I can guarantee you, we would look at the killing of unborn children the same way we looked at the enslaving and the killing of black Americans. The Lord will be, I think the Lord will be back before 100 years. But that's my personal belief. Nobody knows the day or the hour. But be careful about what you believe the popular. Um, saying is. Don't go with popularity. Go with what the Word of God says. All life is precious. And I just follow the Bible. God says when you were in your mother's womb I formed you. That means that you're a creation of God and every child that's in a mother's womb is on your property. Just like you belong to God what's formed in the Bible in, in the belly of a woman in the womb of a woman is born of God. That's my problem with the idea of abortion. And um, it's just a biblical thing. It's, it's immoral. <clears throat> 13, let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry, uh, revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh, the carnal nature, to fulfill its lusts or strong desires. Put on Christ. It means make clothe yourselves with Jesus Christ, his nature, his attributes, 
his teachings. We have the mind of Christ if we're willing to allow the Holy Spirit to take the scriptures and make them flesh so that we don't walk in our carnal nature. We can do that. It's getting tougher and tougher in the United States to be able to do that. It's very hard. It's very hard to live in America right now with the way our, our, our morality is. It's, it's just a very, very difficult time. We older people remember the double standard. Now, there is no double standard with the younger generation because what's taught in all the schools, I know I'm like a broken record, I've been saying it for 20 years, but this is where we're at right now. The teaching, there's nothing wrong with homosexuality, nothing wrong with thinking, even though you're anatomically a boy, there's nothing wrong with, with declaring that you're a girl. I mean, what do you think, you're God? You can just make yourself into what you want to be. It's fantasy world. Do that in kindergarten where you could be a plane or I'm gonna be a truck. Okay, one day and the next day at, at, at playtime. No, nah, I want to be a plane. You know, I'm going to be Superman. You can do this in kindergarten, but full-grown adults shouldn't think that you can create what you want to be and make everybody else forced to go ahead and do that by law. That's called insanity. Okay, it's just total insanity. And as soon as the church wakes up and starts teaching people in the younger generation that you got to stand up or ask your kids, and you're going to wonder why your kids, and I'm talking about you know, 20-somethings that are going to have children. You think our kids are screwed up, some of them? Wait till the next generation gets up because there's no double standard anymore. Anything goes. Whatever you feel you want to do, you should be able to do as long as you're not hurting anybody. Okay, whatever that means. Okay, actually, that's just hedonism. And that's a philosophy that's been around for, th you know, thousands of years, the worship of pleasure and the eradication of discomfort. We live in America in society that reads that way. But if I'm going to be a Christian, I've got to fight the good fight of faith. Deny myself. Amen. Let's stand on our feet and close in prayer.